Today, if I may, I would like to beg your indulgence and answer uh, something that several people... <laughs> That's a bad way to put this. Several people have asked different questions, and this is a way to answer several of them. But also, in addition to that, what I want to do is give you something of a sneak peek. You see, the next section of of the game that is going to happen, decision-wise from the player's perspective, is actually quite simple. It is very... it is relatively linear, all things considered. Not literally linear. If they really wanted to do other things, they could, but I already I know my players, and I know they tend to be um, objective and motivation-based in their character and their role-playing. And so the fact that the island is literally disintegrating... Well, not literally, but, you know, for all intents and purposes, societally and in many ways physically disintegrating at their back, and the fact that it was a four days journey on the ship in order to reach the mainland means that they are basically in quite a hurry in order to try and do something about this. So I am reasonably certain what the next several actions they're going to take are and, and where that's going to lead, uh, depending on how they... Uh, up to a certain point, at which point it'll depend on the players again. Now, before any of you out there accuse me of being linear, uh, I would like to point out that while raising the island was something that I planned for well in advance, very much in advance, you, you know, quite a while ago. In fact, uh, the 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 write-up I did where I mentioned that blue and violet mages are world movers, I did that kind of on purpose as a little bit of a joke to myself because I knew even back then that if the, 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 this situation would happen and that that would be the kind of power required in order to fix the situation. So don't you know, I, obviously I knew that this was a very likely possibility, but there were many ways they could have gotten off the island or resolved the situation in other matters. I'm not going to share them because I don't want to give any of the players any ideas. But this next section is arguably the moment I have been waiting for the most in this entire campaign. Their first step onto the mainland. There is a sense of wonder and exploration that I kind of wanted to get across, and I fear, and indeed am quite nervous even now, that I am not going to be sufficiently eloquent to get across what I see up here, what I what I want to get, what I want to convey. I'm going to try, though. I am basically going to give you a description of what they are going to, the same general description they're going to get. It's going to be different when I tell it to them, obviously, because I I don't have a speech. I you know. I'm, but before I get to that, I would like to share some of the tools I have for GMing. Now, I've mentioned these before. I should probably pull up the camera so I can see what I'm doing here. There we go. I've mentioned these before. They're just these little uh, notepad things, right? These are absolutely invaluable. As a quick peek here, all of this is what is extreme shorthand for several of the details. I'll actually be using this in, in my description that I'm about to do here. And a very, very rough map of the very generalized things. You know, it's basically uh, a cheat sheet as my mother used to call such things in the, in her in her job as a pharmacist you know it isn't the full detail it's just something to spark your memory now a couple other neat little tricks i've gotten here actually there's one thing i've been wanting to show you guys for quite a while since heavier than it looks this is my setting and my rules now what's funny about this is this isn't even actually complete anymore i went ahead and made a nice little index here. So you can stri squi stri s skip straight to the section you want, and as you can kind of tell, yeah, you can sort of see it. There's actually dividers, each of which are labeled properly, so you can see, well, this is the section about this, and this is the section about that. It is, doesn't go into full detail. Uh, in fact, there's a few sections here that basically are off-limits to the players. Um, I also have quite a few what I like to call random notes in the side pockets here that have to do with specifics. You know, a lot of this is, again, that sort of generalized information, but for example, uh, let me give you one one specific example here, if you'll give me a moment to get it all out. Here we go. The, in my setting, in my world, there are eight temples maintained by the elemental order to the eight elements. These temples have been around since time immemorial. As in, there's a period in history, both for the island and the mainland, in which history kind of started, even though they know happen, stuff happened before that. It, it's a basic dark age. They lost history. But these temples have been around since even before that. This whole section here is, is going into significant details on the labyrinths, uh, or trials, or whatever you want to call it, that exist within these temples. Now, before you actually think, well, that's just kind of cliche, admittedly it is a little bit cliche. Actually, this is only an uh, elaboration on two of the um, trials, now that I look at it. <laughs> so this is two of the trials. Um, but 
this it, it, the whole point uh, you know I don't I don't want to get into specifics but the the whole point is that it's something you undertake because you choose to you know you want to to further your connection you personally with that element and indeed one of the reasons that there's so many papers there for only two trials is because it's very specific to the individual if you follow me and I've got some more back here uh, this is a tool I w sincerely doubt I will ever use in this campaign, but it's one that I feel like sharing anyways. If you can see what you're looking at here, this is just basically random dungeons. There's quite a few. And, yeah. I did not actually make these. A friend of a friend. Or, no. Actually, I think Lori made these. I don't know if you watched this, Lori, but... Anyways, thank you for these. I'm still using them. Uh, Sarah made several as well, I believe. But in any case, they're even labeled in several cases, if you can actually tell that. They're not labeled anything specific, just, you know, room A4 and B6 and all that fun stuff. And another neat tool, which I also don't use, but again, I thought I'd share, is this. These are little printed out... Oh, shoot! Papers that are falling. Uh, NPC cards that you can put uh, quick and dirty stats on. In all honesty, uh, I do like to use these for more random stuff. That is to say, if... Well, okay, let me take a step back here. One of the sections here is literally just called Quests. All of this is random quest hooks. It, this is going to be hard to show you, but it's this whole section down here. All of this is just basically random quests that are designed by their very nature to be dynamic. They're designed to be able to be plopped down basically anywhere within a generalized location. In other words, if you were to look at my whole continent, there's the Dyers, there's the East, and then there's the North. And that's really it when it comes down to it. Those three sections are all close enough in similarity when it comes to this kind of a thing that I can generalize in such a manner. Now, obviously, if you go to this, if you go to a, a town within the show empire and, you know, something's going on there, then that's going to be significantly different than if you go to a town within the Neveri Confederacy. But you get the general concept, right? And I like to design these dynamic quests every time uh, it occurs to me, basically. And usually, if there's a specific boss fight, uh, as I've mentioned before, I tend to do stylized boss fights, very very Zelda in, in approach, or WoW, or whatever equivalent you want to use there. It's the same basic concept, you know. Instead of just, I attack, you attack, and I have these abilities, it's, you know, I'm going to do this in phase one, and this in phase two, and here's my AI loop, that kind of a thing. And so, you know, for example, there's this quest hook right here. Uh, which one is this one? This is designed for... Uh, now, see, some of these are specifically designed for a certain area. For example, this one is actually designed to be only happening within Neveri. And, uh, there's actually quite a bit of information on this one, but it gets to this point, and I actually have the boss fight where I have several of the stats that are mentioned here, but more importantly, what he does that is, makes him unique from any other random uh, enemy, and so forth and so on. And this is quite extensive. Uh, to give you a little bit of an idea about this much over here, let's see if I can get that straight on. This is the rules, my custom rule set. This is my setting. And the real irony is this doesn't even cover all of it, because a lot of it has been growing as I go on, uh, as my most recent retcon probably uh, emphasizes, and the fact that I keep adding to it. I have far too many problems with ambition, I swear. Moving on. Um, I'm going to show you some things I've hinted at before here. These, laugh if you want, are fuzzy sticks, okay? Now, I specifically got this pack. See if you can see the colors there. I know the lighting isn't great down here. But I specifically got this because this will allow me to specifically have one color that will always mean one of the eight elements and have a couple of generic ones as well. Uh, for example, Fear Nasil has an ability, a power she picked up, which is uh, she turns into a whirlwind of flora leaves, flowers, that kind of thing, and it covers a 3x3 three three uh, circle. And it, in case you're wondering, yes, this is 3x3 three three on the grid, and so she can just use this to place down and say this is her for the immediacy and, you know, move it around, that kind of a thing, because she still has her movement while she's doing that. And those little fizzy sticks are amazing for doing, like, you know, cone attacks or area of atta effect attacks, or if I'm just trying to it draw a specific thing on the map and I don't want to actually get out the pen, or, you know, if I want to display something on one of my paper maps that I don't want to draw on, period. You know, they're, they're invaluable tools, and it was only like... Uh, actually, I think it was only like $2 or something like that. I got this... Uh, I got most of this stuff I'm about to show you at a craft store near here. Now... Uh, this case thing... If you can even see this. I got these at Walmart. This case, this overall thing. Uh, pretty cheap, all things considered. Pretty much exactly what I wanted to. 
All right, and I've got when I'm when I'm doing the map on the grid. I don't like to draw on the grid. Uh, I can, but one of the things we tend to do is we tend to uh, as any given dungeon, any given sanctuary, any given place that we're in tends to draw it across multiple sessions. Surely you've seen this to some extent or another by now, and I sh I've mentioned that in the earlier videos when I was doing a single video to cover like three sessions. And so the uh, using these uh, tongue depressor things or popsicle sticks or whatever you want to call them is extremely useful in leaving the map there so I don't have to redraw it later. You, you follow me? So these specifically, these are shorter ones, and these are doors, as opposed to the shorter ones like this, which represent a locked door. You follow me? This is all very basic stuff. It's just giving you, trying to give you guys some ideas and giving you some insight into what I do. On the top there, if you can see it, I don't want to tilt it too much so they don't spill out. Those are dragon tears, quite a few of them. They are not called that when you go to the craft store. In fact, I actually don't remember what they're called. Something like fishbowl gems or something like that. But anyways, I got one for each of the four, the four primary elements right there. And, uh, yes, I have a second one. Uh, can I say I like my props? Uh, I'm going to leave this one closed, because that's going to make it a little easier. Now, I like to be standardized so the players always know what they're seeing. So these ones, I'll, I'll actually open it up so you can see, but you can see these are larger than the normal ones I use. Uh, these ones are black. Black almost always indicates trash, uh, either in form of ads or enemies that don't necessarily matter. Silver is 99% of the time going to be something that's unique. In other words, if there's something silver, it probably warrants some kind of attention. And these ones, which you can barely see there, are clear. These are... Uh, usually used to, to delineate objects, doodads, chairs, that kind of a thing, right? Now, occasionally I'll mix it up, but I'll always make a point of saying, you know, blah. Oh, and of course, and as you can see, I have quite a few additional popsicle tips for generating dungeons. The long ones there, whoops, wrong direction. Long ones, normal sized ones there for the walls, and small sized ones, which also help me to make my dungeons in, you know, different than the 5x5 five five grid manner. So this, this is awesome, and this whole th thing did not cost me particularly much money. Overall, I think it was like, uh, Eight, six, nine, twelve. Something like thirty bucks for everything I've just shown you. Now this thing was ten dollars. No, it was eight dollars. But this was actually a gift from one of my players. This thing has been a godsend. This is a whiteboard. Okay, it's actually a magnetic whiteboard, as you can tell there. And um, these things, I don't actually use these all that often. But I'll tell you what I do use all that often if I can find it. I was playing with it when I started the video. Where'd it go? Shoot. Well, in any case, the, uh, the the implications and uses for the whiteboard in the in the D and D experience are actually pretty obvious. I'd say all things considered, this is the perfect thing to sketch out anything that is relatively temporary. You know, for example, uh, and I'm going to be drawing horribly because this is a very bad angle. But when I was I mentioned in my last session the coins they found, I was actually able to do this and do a very rough drawing, very very rough drawing, of the guy. You know, kind of like there. This is the worst drawing I've ever done, and you know. I can't write upside down. Gold Lord, right there. You know, I was actually able to do this and give them a visual representation. Now, I'm sure some of you out there are thinking, well, why can't you just describe it and imagine that? Yes, I can, but I would prefer to to have a visual element to it if that makes any sense. Uh, especially uh, the way I think. I tend to think in in a very visual sense of the word, <laughs> no pun intended. And so I like having props. I like having the ability. Whoops, excuse me to see what I'm looking at, and even if it's an allegory, even if it's just an approximate. Oh, and by the way, this pen has an eraser right on it there, so this is very useful. And I can just go right over this. Earlier, um, we started and then stopped a session, unfortunately, and this is part of why these thoughts are still so fresh in my mind, because I was prepping literally all night for the descriptive thing I was going to do, but to give you a very rough idea of what I had on here at the time... Since I have the layout of the city pretty well memorized at this point. I'm going to do this really roughly, though I spent some considerable more time doing this last time when I did it. There we go. And I add some docks out here that are going to just look like twigs because I don't feel like doing it properly right now. I had this whole thing laid out in an overall design of the city of Holtberg that they're going to be uh, approaching. And, you know, each one of these districts was labeled, and I was trying to give them a general idea of the size of the place, but in addition to that, the variety of the place, and, um, you know, obviously the docks over here, the airship yards over here, the SID construction yards over here, That's this is actually the primary exit gate over here, which leads over to where the railway con connects. There's actually a gateway up here and a gateway down here, too. 
Uh, we got the royal quarter, the pri the high residential, the common residential. This is where the warehouses are, right next to the docks. You know, blah blah blah. You get the general point. And so having this is extremely useful, and probably one of the most used tools I use nowadays. Uh, especially because, ironically, it is so easy to use for a temporary thing. Now, obviously, I, for other things, I prefer something more permanent. For example, one of the things I'm not showing you is the map. Uh, part of the reason for that is I'm not sure I could fit it over here. It is actually done on poster, and something that I have been sketching myself uh, bit by bit. It's not. It's nowhere near done, and I keep be getting torn as to how many details I should put on it, because, you know, it's not only is it a map, but it's a player map, as in, it's what the players know, not what I know if you follow my my logic there. So, not 100% sure how much more of that I should do. And yet you're noticing this does take a little bit of time to erase when I'm using this tiny eraser. I actually have a larger eraser, I just didn't feel the need to bring it over here. But this is awesome. Seven bucks, Walmart, boom. Overall, an extremely useful tool. Um, and honestly, that's it. Oh, by the way, I, I actually left this over here just so I could show you. This is literally what I'm talking about. You see this pack of things? I haven't even opened it. This is the one I just bought today, fresh. Because uh, I'm running low. But I use these things constantly. Absolutely invaluable. And we'll go... Oh, and by the way, this is also magnetic, so I can just... Well, okay, you can't see it, but... Here. <laughs> Alright, I'm gonna done... I'm done being a dork. Now I'm gonna try being a geek. Uh, now, what I'm going to try to do, and I am probably going to fail, because I am not that good at on-the-spot wordplay like this, is I'm going to try and describe to you as if I was narrating this scene, as if I was trying to get across the invocative nature of what this scene really should be to the players at this point. Uh, I would like to start by saying one of the thing one of the things I've gone very much out of my way to do is I've been very vague about the overall nature of the island, about Visay and LaSalle. Part of that is because I wanted the players and the viewers and everybody involved to kind of fill in the gaps with their own automatic assumptions about life, right? And every time someone would have a question because something didn't quite make sense, I just kind of let that question sit there because they're right, it didn't quite make sense. And it is not until now that the general, oh, you know, it makes so much sense now, has been happening. In fact, one of my players almost literally said what I just said, you know, oh my god, no wonder, you know, it, it makes so much sense. And uh, explained so much about everything and all the questions that they had all the, up, all the way up to this point. And, and so forth and so on. In fact, uh, one of the NPCs they talk with, uh, Ariana specifically, has a speech uh, that I've already, uh, I think I already mentioned this to you guys, I can't actually recall. No. Uh, basically saying, you know, I can't believe I didn't see this. You know, I, I can't believe this never occurred to me. And uh, <laughs> both the players thought I was making fun of them, but I wasn't. I was trying to get across the point that that was the point. It hadn't occurred to anybody. And it was by design, you know, I, I consider that that I have succeeded as a GM, that I successfully hid that fact by never really discussing it in detail, and because I never brought it to anybody's attention, nobody ever thought about it. I'm not saying nobody out there ever thought about it, I'm just saying, from my perspective, I feel like I succeeded in this mystery. But all that being... The reason I bring that up now is because life on the island and life, how life functions out there, how things work out there, is so completely, utterly, violently different from how things are everywhere else that, especially on the main continent of Dareth, that I really felt like I wanted to get this the Im impact of this scene out. Even though the players are, and the characters are at this point in time, in quite a bit of a hurry, I actually asked, you know, asked them for this indulgence to go ahead and, and discuss this scene, as I'm going to try to do to you now. And we ended up calling it because everyone was tired and, and wanted to go to sleep. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, and you'll forgive me if I have my eyes closed, because I'm trying to actually picture this. They are on a ship which is, by their standards, significant. It is uh, basically one of the best ships they have in the Radorn fleet. Uh, a military vessel. It's basically the equivalent of a schooner, for all intents and purposes. It is taking several days to get to their destination, which is the city of Holtberg. It is something that has been brought up that they could land closer, because there is land that is closer, but that land is n not necessarily where they want to be, especially since they need to... Re Ariana and Alexander both need to report in as soon as possible. So this ship has been sailing basically as fast as it can. Um, they have literally been having to rely on magical enchantments in order to keep this ship functional because this ship was never designed for waves, if you follow me. It was never designed for 
ch uh, chop. It was never designed for storms. You know, none of these things are things they've ever encountered before. There's a reason why rain was such an alien concept to these people. So the ship is literally j just kind of limping along. And so not only is it going slowly by the standards of the mainland, it's going slowly by their own standards. They do eventually make it there, and after this long, arduous journey, the very first thing they see is a massive wall. This wall is made of a solid, thinly gray material that seems to reflect the sunlight directly back upon them. It stands over a hundred yards tall in all directions. It reaches out into the sea with regular battlements, with regular towers, which have people posted upon them, and uh, cannons and, and that sort of thing at, at the very top, and of course coming out of the turrets. This whole this wall comes straight out into the ocean and then goes right out and goes so far into the distance that you actually can't fully see where it terminates. As you sail northward, in order to get around the wall, Ariana has left uh, very specific directions. You know, these flags have to be sailed into these colors at these times so that they know that we are friendly. We are not uh, pirates, bandits, or uh, neutrals. And uh, Neutral isn't the formal term for it, but it basically rever refers to someone who is not an uh, has no official business there, but would like to make a case for the fact that we should be here. And it's something that's been in maritime law for some time. You know, if someone needs to to port anywhere, regardless of circumstance, they could come in under under the circumstances and say, "We don't have the right to dock here, but we are in trouble, or we have something that's an emergency, or whatever. Please let us dock here," and they will. Uh, figure that out on the fly, you know, dynamically based on the situation. So she gives specific instructions. You sail in, and the next thing you see as you as you turn around the corner of this massive... Uh, it's built not as a straight uh, cylindrical tower. The the two outermost parts of the wall that, that are creating this opening. You know, if the wall comes out like this, there's these two spires that come out like solid crystal. It's the same material, but it's clearly been sculpted to make these things come straight up and go significantly higher than is any reasonable reason for them to do so. And as you pass, there's this distinct uh, sensation of like a tingle all across your skin as you realize that there is this sort of magical field you've just passed through, which could probably be used for many different purposes. But nonetheless, the next thing you see is stretched out in all directions in front of you, from miles to the left and to the right, is this massive cityscape. I know I keep using that word, f forgive me. There are so many vessels. There are more vessels than you've ever seen in your whole life, just within this enclosed area and within the waters here. It's actually still several, uh, uh, a good mile and a half or two in order to just reach the shoreline from here. Docks come out in all directions, in all sizes. There are clearly ones designed for military vessels all down there to the south. There's several uh, significantly large docks that are mer mercantile in nature that all connect and have uh, massive facilities at attached to them. Each facility is, a, is, a, is in constant motion. There is nothing going on except for people running around in all directions, and cranes moving, and noise, there is so much noise it's impossible, and the scent is, is unusual, it's invocative, it's very salty, it's very powerful and pungent, there's, there's almost this briskness to it. And the wind is coming through, it's very crisp, it's almost like 50 degrees-ish, give or take, you know, it's, it's, it's very cool, crisp winds that are blowing through this area, and you can tell that it's been filtered in some manner, so that you can just smell the air. Uh, and as you look further to the right, you know, you see some of the smaller docks, there's some more personal vessels there, there's the, the, the neutral section that I mentioned earlier, there's a uh, smaller mercantile area, you know, that kind of thing, all the personal docks. And so this ship sails over to the north, to the far end on the right here, and it takes uh, several additional minutes, almost actually an hour, in order to just, just to navigate this, not because it's so far necessarily, but because there are so many ships in the water and there's so many people trying to direct it, and it's like this Pardon me, it's like this ballad is going on. It's like this uh, ballet, actually, is what I want to call it. You know, ev all, there are literally over a hundred ships navigating these waters right now, and every single one, none of them are crashing with one another. All of them are moving in perfect synchronization to not encounter any of the others. And it's actually kind of funny because this ship is having such a hard time keeping up with the constant maneuvering changes. It does manage it, though. I already decided that on a dice roll, actually. You know, it does manage it. When you dock, 
The very first thing you are assaulted by, most powerfully of all, is the noise. It had been slowly building the slow, the closer you got to the, to the actual cityscape, to the shore. And now that you're actually here, you, you realize that it is just this deafening roar, this, this undercurrent that seems to drown out everything else, and you can't even define anything within it other than people and machines and... and animals and just noise. There's noise everywhere as you disembark. Um, Ariana gives you a moment in order to actually savor this, this sensation as you just look up and then up and then up. You see buildings towering up to the sky. You see entire structures constructed solely of crystal, of, of glass. You see entire spires made out of obsidian and you spy buildings immediately next to them, immediately next to these massive, almost alien-looking structures. You see just a simple brick house with with a little patio and, and someone out there just kind of, you know, sitting and enjoying the breeze. You s and then you could look a little bit further and you you spot something that seems like it was carved out of some kind of emerald. And it, it it's formed in this circular, uh, almost uh, coliseum-like manner. And there are there are lights of different colors and type types c flashing within left and right, you know, just constantly making this barrage of no noise and 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 light. And the the more you look, the more you see in all directions of of just this this completely un unheard of 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 cityscape. The first thing you notice when you really start to walk out towards the street and you start to get out of the docks area is that there are so many people here. There are there are vehicles of a sort. There are, um, you know, of course, there's uh, carts that are moving on their own because they have been enchanted properly and they have these uh, solid crystals that you of a material you don't actually recognize that have been tethered to the front of them. And, and there's a mage of some kind wearing elaborate yellow robes and a, and a stylized uh, badge on, on his left breast here. And he is literally uh, casting at the, at the crystal as they move in order to direct it and, and make it go here into it. And you see several of those of a relatively moderate size, including several of a much larger size. You see one carrying crates upon crates upon crates of materials and goods, you know, larger than the ship you just got off moving through the street as you go, and you have to dodge in order to get out of the way in time. There are so many people here. This is where I'm going to revert to my notes for just a second. There are so many creatures around here. You see uh, elves, of course, and you see dwarves, but then every now and again you'll spot an elf that has really deep blue skin and, and unusually colored eyes and green hair, and you've never seen an elf like that. And then you see much smaller people. They look like humans, but they stand uh, no no taller than your hip, and each one of them is is just kind of laughing and, and chatting. There's, there's there's a bundle of them right over there, and every one of them is, is talking. If you listen in, you can hear them talking about the fishing of this season, how they can't wait to get back, uh, you know, to Eastham in order to to in engage in their favorite sport. You see fairies, you recognize them. You know, the the women and men, they 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 almost seem to float as they move. There's this sort of air about them. They do actually walk, but more than anyone else, they seem to be holding themselves as though they were separate from the crowd crowd. You see Lugians, you, you again recognize those from Alexander, the massive uh, uh, creatures, you know, lumbering through with a surprising deafness, and in every, uh, you see more Lugians and Elves than anything else. They are by far the most prolific of the races you encounter here. Uh, you, you'll see Lugians just with with aprons on, you know, in, in a cooking store trying to, to sell their wares, or you'll see one over in this area, working on uh, repairing a crane whose magicite has worn out, and it shouldn't have, and he's not sure why it's causing an excess drain, you know. And you'll see trolls, tall, gangly creatures who are hunched over so that they can l uh, stand more at, at average average height, with long tusks coming out of their face and uh, usually some kind of wild hair. You see banderlings, which are these uh, strange, very skinny, yet very muscly-looking furred creatures with with faces that are hard to describe but have very sharp teeth and one of them actually spots you looking at it and waves amiably and, and you find yourself so confused that you and, but you don't want to look out like you're you know trying to look at them oddly so you know you wave back and the band thing's like ah and then just kind of keeps going about his business you see ogres not quite, uh, technically only about as tall as the trolls, but every one of them is massive, wider than the Lugians are, and each one, you know, you can actually feel their steps, even amongst the, the raucous noise that is going. And as you, as you keep going further north, uh, trying to reach the Royal Quarter, this starts to 
distend a bit, and, to, and, and the, the, the roar of the crowd tends to die down just a little bit. You see orcs walking to and from, their skin uh, green to palish gray, and every one of them with sharp tusks coming up, just, just little ones. And, uh, but there's no, it, despite their almost bestial appearance, the two or, or three you actually pass by seem incredibly amiable, amiable and one of them actually pulls you aside really quick, uh, actually just d d pulls you out of the group and, and says, you know, look, I, I've got a great deal. I just got a shipment of fish in, it's from the northern quarter, the old Thoy have brought it in, it's lovely, you, you can't believe it. And, and, you know, you have to say, well, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm on a very important uh, mission. And he's like, oh, adventure, I understand, not a problem. If you're looking for fish in the future, though, you know what to look for, you know, just that kind of a thing. As you go, you start to see other creatures, ones that are much more difficult to describe. You see um, these slightly taller than human, almost fish-like looking creatures with long, very uh, multi-knuckled fingers, which seem extremely dexterous, and they have these heads that scope down and, and terminate in large eyes and, white, and a wide mouth, and several of them are uh, discussing matters with several other creatures, which appear to be, for all intents and purposes, humans who have had their heads replaced by snakes, and so the human part of them, and their skin is scaled, mind you, it's fully scaled, but otherwise their appearance is fully that of a human, which you're well aware of, but then, the, then from this point up, it's just snake, and the snake head terminates in so the face is looking forward and they're just having this discussion in a language you, you've never even heard before uh, with these other fish-like creatures. As you go further, you, you almost uh, you feel something brushed by your leg and you look down and you see several small, very pale-skinned, um, almost oily skin with, with the occasional spatches of hair coming out of their arms and their head with wide uh, black eyes looking up at you and one of them actually comes up and says, sorry, in this tiny little squeaky voice and keeps going. And every now and again, as you as you look right uh, t towards the dock area and towards the warehouses that you're passing, you see golems. You recognize them as golems because of uh, your, you know your experiences. But these are golems that you've never seen before. There's golem comp composed entirely of water that, at first, you weren't entirely sure what you were looking at. There was just this wave that was moving, and you know, it would reach out and it would grab the crate and it would move it up here. And after a moment, you realize that all they're doing is just simple manual labor, and yet it looks so phenomenal to watch this this wave, this living wave, moving these things. And further on, you see one made completely of sand, and when you say later on, you see one that seems to be constructed of solid wood. You know. All this sort of thing. Every now and again, you see uh, one of these people. Uh, one of the one of the elves is walking along with with a with a creature on a leash. You've never seen this creature before. The creature itself is is almost as tall as you are, even though it's hunched over on its three legs and it's just kind of bounding along in front of its owner. You know, and, and you see a, a much a, a few s a small litter of creatures which someone is trying to give away on the side of the street because they they can't support them and you know they're like yeah you want you want to you want a fur you know it's it's a nice little pet you don't have to feed them that much and you're just kind of no thank you I'm kind of in a hurry and you keep going onwards and as your thoughts are pulled away from the people and from the, the noise and from everyone who is around you, you start to realize that there are so many things here that you don't understand. There are lights. It, uh, by the time they arrive, it, the sun is already setting, and yet it doesn't really feel like it. In fact, it takes you a moment to realize that the sun has, in fact, started to set because the light is so profound here. There are actually these pillars which have... Uh, crystals on top of them, which are giving off a very pleasant, uh, almost Im imperceptible sort of light, which makes it feel like it's still daytime without actually glaring at you. You see uh, shops and warehouses, all of which have signs in languages that, as, y as you're staring at it, and as you try to comprehend the language, it actually looks like the sign moves until the, the, the text on it, it changes to something you ac recognize, common in this case, and, it, and then it spells out, you know, Joe's Crab Shack, you know, it's stuff like that or uh, the royal quarter up ahead, or off-limits to anybody without a diplomatic visa, you know, that kind of thing. As you're walking along, you see a creature you haven't seen before. Uh, it's a very small, uh, diminutive creature, which almost looks like a fox that's standing on its hind legs, with a long snout and, and a very uh, polite demeanor. He, he's... He, God, I'm losing my words. He is uh, attending to a very long line of people, and he's standing right next to, at least you assume it's a he, standing right next to this structure, which seems to be made out of solid pyreal, and comes up in this very stylized thing to form what looks like, a, you know, is, is a statue of a flame. And as the might, you know, I'm sorry, as the creature, uh, takes 
several pieces of gold from the next person in the line. The person in the line, you know, says, I would like to go to Yurak, please. And the, and the creature says, you know, I'm going to need a passport. And the man produces a piece of paper, and the, the creature says, no problem, and touches the thing and touches the man, and he's gone, just like that, in a flash of light. And you're just like, oh, my God. And and, and your mind starts to process what you're looking at here. Just as you're starting to realize that, you, you, you suddenly see this... M- Eight foot tall black chitinous creature come come moving forward uh, in a general direction towards you. Several others uh, behind it. This thing has very long clawed arms coming up out of its back, in addition to its long and dexterous arms here, each of which have, again, very long and multi-knuckled fingers, which terminate in claws that look incredibly sharp. And it has very small beaded eyes, which glow a a deep blue. And there's no mouth that you can discern, although you imagine there is one there. It's just kind of hidden underneath its exoskeleton. And this thing just kind of chitters along for a moment, and it notices you looking at it. And it actually bothers to do this really strange impersonation of a bow, as much as it's is physiology will allow it to do. And then it, it chitters at you for a moment, and you just look at it, and then it realizes, Ah, oh, my apologies. I do not normally use common, but I wish to be as polite as possible. I have not made this trip before. I am very excited to see this city. I, I, I p- imagine you have not seen an Olthoi before. And and you, you just find yourself staring at this insect-like creature, which, and, and you say, yes, I, I, I've never encountered something like you before. I, I apologize for staring. And they, oh, is no problem. I am very used to it. Our appearance is quite monstrous. No worries, though. I am just as excited to see this as you. And you're like, what do you mean? I was like, oh, I, it's all over your face. You are first here, right? First, yes, yes, this is the first time I've ever been to, uh, what's the city called? Holberg. Yeah, and, um... It, it's an amazing place. Oh, yes, I have very much enjoyed my visit. I just finished setting up trade agreements. I will be working soon towards, um... Oh, word. I will be working towards, uh... What do you call when you when you reach out commonly? Um, you mean a, a regular, uh, like a trade route? Yes, I will be making trade route. Many trips. I wish to see more of the world. And, and you say, well, interesting. Now... Forgive me, my throat still hurts. That's why I'm not doing the Olthoi voice like I should, which... (laughs) And there's a reason I'm not doing that. That actually hurt just doing that just now. But you get the general point. It is having a difficult time speaking in common. Um, Actually, it's a he. But anyways. And and so the the Olthoi continues onwards, and, and you just... You find yourself having no idea what to even think about that. And, uh... Ariana mentions that given the time of day, you know, you're actually not going to be able to get an audience with anyone right now. Now, she has a couple of alternatives, but for the moment, you could probably use a good meal, and so could she. So she directs you a little bit further west into the uh, the high the high residential area, which is where she herself lives. And they find... An, you know, Ariana's like, oh, there's, this, there's this restaurant I absolutely love. They serve stuff uh, that they pull all the way down from Yarek. It's, it's delivered by Hub, so it comes extremely fresh. And you can't find this kind of fish out in the ocean. It's only in the inner sea. And, uh, okay, yes, I, I'm, I mean, I'm not really in the mood for seafood right now, but I could go with that. And and, and Alexander Dipson says, you're right. We should go get some uh, Oroch ribs. I think that would be absolutely awesome. And, and Ariana's like, we're not going to serve them Oroch. We want to get them nice food. And then, you know, after a bit of an argument, they finally said, okay, what do you want? You're like, uh, oh, ribs, please. I, I'm not I'm not in a seafood mean, mood right now. Okay, yes, awesome. So he takes you a bit further south to the commons area. Now, when I say this, uh, this trip overall takes several hours of walking because you know, obvious reasons, and when you finally reach the, the destination, you know, there is this this restaurant, is unlike any restaurant you've ever seen, most restaurants are, are, you know, the kind of thing where they're the size of your house, basically, in fact, most of the restaurants you have encountered are double function as the house of the people who actually run the place, this place stretches out, um, like, uh, like half of a farm field, and much of it is outside. Most of the patrons are outside, uh, enjoying enjoying the the moonlight from the three moons, which you've never seen before. And you know, there's these strange devices in the middle of the tables that look like uh, miniaturized crystals that are dancing about in in these very small patterns, almost slight, in the middle of the table, and it's providing most of the light that these people are are eating by. And as one of them comes by, he actually requests, you know, I would like, uh, as you sit, I'm sorry, as you, as you get a thing, Alexander's apparently well-known here, and so he gets you a table almost right away, even though the place is quite busy. 
and you said, and you're like, I have no idea what Alexander's like, don't worry. Uh, all I want to know is, do you want your meat rare or cooked? And you're like, oh, cooked, cooked, please. You know, <laughs> not a problem. And so the chef comes by and he says, what would you like? And there's, uh, you know, I, uh, or our ribs all across the plate. Ariana says, actually, could I just have um, a, a side of bread? Yes, no problem, man. We, we will get you or uh, bread. And or our ribs, uh, how would you like yours? You know, or Alexander's, of course, like absolutely rare. And you're like, I'd, I'd like them very well cooked, please. And, you know, so forth and so on. And the waiter says, no, not uh, not a problem. Give me just one moment, please. And he reaches out to the table, and he puts his hands on the table, and the crystals uh, actually stretch out, and they're still providing light, but they start circling around massively, and this portal comes out of the table and starts to rise up, and you see your meals there on plates, ready to go, basically right there, right then and there. And he says, oh... I'm sorry, hang on just a second. And he, he grabs the... He, he, push, he basically pushes one of the dishes back down, and then pushes his fingers to the thing, and you can tell that he's he's chanting something or just under his breath underneath it. And then a different dish comes back up. He says, there you go, rare ribs. I, I Sorry for the delay. And Alexander's like, not a problem. I love this place. Here's And he gives him a nice tip of several gold coins right into the guy's pocket. And the guy says, thank you very much, sir. And, you know, you st you, you've got these ribs that are like this big sitting in front of you now. And you're just like, uh, how do I eat these? And Alexander's like, like this! <laughs> you know, of course, Alexander's a Lugian, so he is, <laughs> he can do this with one hand. So you, you know, pick this up. And this thing is coated in juices, and you just start tasting things you've never tasted in your life before. This thing, it, it actually makes your tongue hurt just a little bit. Be, you know, it starts to burn. And, but as you start to get it, you really start to enjoy it, and the meat is incredibly d delicious. It's one of, It feels like the most nutritious thing you've eaten in the last five days, uh, which I guess actually it is. <laughs> and um, you start digging into this thing, and you, just, you love it. Oh my god, this is the most amazing food. Oh, and you, you finish off the whole thing in, rel in so little time, and you have a sensation that uh, is very strange. It's, it's hard to, to pinpoint. It feels like you, you have an injury, but, but it's very mild. It's down here. And uh, you start to describe this, and Alexander starts to laugh and says, I think you ate too much. Now, this is another alien guns up to you. Uh, ate too much? Yeah, you, you just ate too much. You, you need to hold back there and start to figure out, you know how to eat properly again. I have a feeling that's not something you guys are used to. And, and you're like, yeah, I guess not. Holy crap. Oh, now I'm really tired. <laughs> you know. And so, uh, he's like, well, I'll tell you what. Uh, let, let's go ahead and change the temperature here. Let's perk you up a bit. And he, and he touches the stones in the middle a couple of times, uh, the out outermost stone. And the temperature just around this, this area with you all of a sudden gets much colder. And you're like, whoa, whoa, God. And you look at him weird, and he's like, okay, too much, too much, and he taps the middle stone, and, and the temperature raises a couple more times. There we go, is that better? And you're like, yes, yes, thank you. My goodness. And uh, as as you're talking, he, he frowns at the stones for a moment and says, ah, oh, no wonder, PTC pile of crap. And you're like, what? PTC, it's, it's the Provincial Trading Company. You have no idea what I'm talking about. Right, okay. The PTC basically provides 90% of what you're seeing around here, all this common mundane stuff. And I, I, one of the reasons I like this place, admittedly, is that they're, they're nothing fancy. And Ariana pipes up, yeah, actually, uh, the restaurant I was hoping to take you to doesn't actually utilize any PTC goods. They are exclusively... Um, Excuse me, they exclusively use Praxis Industrial. And and Alexander just kind of rolls his eyes. Yeah, i got to have the nice stuff for Miss Diplomat over here. And she's like, I, I don't see anything wrong with the nice stuff. And all these names don't really mean anything to you, of course. You're just like, got, gotcha. So there's one thing that makes things, and there's another thing that makes things. Okay. And you start examining the table, and you, and you realize for the very first time that this table is actually made of solid perial. And and as as you push towards the table, trying to see if there's anything you can understand about the portal, it, but there's nothing there. There's no trace of it. And it's just how did he even do that? I don't understand. But at this point in time, you're, you're sufficiently tired, and this is when Ariana pipes up that she has a plan. And this is the point at which I'm going to stop uh, talking about the setting for a little bit and and go ahead and cut off the video. Um, I have no idea how I did. I'm admittedly a little nervous to see all the comments of people saying, you're awful. I'm going to go ahead and release a regular video today to make up for the fact that this is kind of a not regular video. And uh, I hope I will talk to you guys soonish.